Well, welcome everybody. I think we still have a few people um, just uh, coming in. Uh, so we're just going to wait a moment until they've all arrived in the, uh, the digital room. more ticking in. So welcome uh, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cara Rodway, I'm the interim head of the Eccles Centre for American Studies at the British Library and it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to our event today. Uh, this is the first in a, a series of um, first in a series of three talks uh, are looking at the the Mayflower myth in Britain and uh, the easy to remember because the next uh, the next events are at exactly this time on the next two Mondays and uh, we'll share some more details uh, later to give you a list of those events if you haven't seen uh, the others so you can if you're interested you can you can follow up. Um, I'm really excited to welcome our speaker today uh, Dr Ed Downey who's a postdoctoral researcher specialising in the history of popular culture. His doctoral thesis examined the social and political context that informed the development of print culture during the French Revolution and the Romantic period. And he has been the research associate on an AHRC funded project called Voyaging Through History, the Mayflower in Britain, 1620 to 2020. Which uh, he and through this project, he's been recovering examples of the uh, long and protean legacy of the Mayflower story in British cultural history. And so it's that uh, that work which he's going to be drawing on today. Um, and the Eccles Centre has been a partner on the Voyaging Through History project, and we've been really excited to help facilitate uh, the work of Ed and his his colleagues on the project. And I know that there's an awful lot of British Library material which has made its way into, into this presentation, and so I'm really excited to be able to share with you some of the ways that, um, that this, this uh, North American, uh, this British and North American transatlantic relationship has has been understood uh, in Britain, and obviously it's very interesting in in this you know four four hundredth anniversary year as we commemorate the the sailing to think about what it's what it's meant for British audiences, particularly at different moments, and kind of what elements of the story have been preserved and what elements have have fallen away because they didn't perhaps serve the um, the, the particular cultural moment that they arose in. Uh, so I'm going to stop rabbiting on now because you're not actually here to hear me; you're here to hear Ed. Um, so Ed is going to, to share his screen. He has a, a PowerPoint um, that he's going to, to speak to. Um, and then he's going to talk for about, I hope, 40, 45 minutes. I will have to rugby tackle him at the 45 yeah. minute point in a virtual sense <laughs> to ensure that, um, that, that we, we stick to time because we want to have um, some question and answers. You're very welcome to type your questions into the Q&A uh, or to the chat box um, as we go along. Um, and I, uh, the, the digital elves in the background will collate your questions and then I will put those to Ed um, as we go. So, well, sorry, at the end, um, but you're welcome to ask the questions as we go along. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, to hand over now to Ed, who is going to start talking. Okay, can you see my screen there? Is everything okay? I'm getting the, yep, yeah, that's fine, we're good. Brilliant. Okay, thank you everybody for joining. So this is Novelists, Poets and Pilgrims, the Mayflower in British Literature. So first of a series of three talks, as Cara mentioned, and yeah, most of the materials that I'll be showing you guys today are available to view in the British Library. So if you want to trace and track any of them down, uh, it's very easy to do that. Um, I'll give you um, just a summary of the structure of today's talk. So what I'm going to do initially is introduce our project and explain a little bit about the methodology behind what we're doing. Then I want to consider the first popular references to the New Plymouth story uh, in, British, in the British press um, during what's often termed as the American crisis of the, of the 1760s and the 1770s. Then I'm going to move on and examine the growth of myth making around the Pilgrim Fathers during the Romantic period and we're going to be looking specifically at Felicia Hemans, a very important author, for popularising that term, the Pilgrim Fathers. It wasn't always attached to this story of New Plymouth uh, and the founding of the colony in, in 1620. Then we're going to look on 
at some other 19th century references from Chartists, abolitionists and evangelical writers. And finally, we're going to be taking a more in-depth look at one particular Mayflower poet, John Boyle O'Reilly. He was an Irish revolutionary. I've put this in to show you the various ideological variants that are encapsulated within this story. And you have everything from ultra conservative Christian evangelicalism and right wing sort of conservatism, all the way to very, very revolutionary forms of writing and poetry. So it's an interesting myth from that perspective in terms of its different variants. Um, so our project, um, we've got a project page, which I should promote, which is voyaging through history Dot UK. We've also got a Twitter, which is twitter.com slash Mayflowerbrit, and a Facebook page, uh, Facebook slash Mayflowerbrit. So if you want to join in with conversations about what we're doing uh, on this anniversary year, please feel free to get in contact with our social media and have a look at our webpage. Uh, we've also re recently, very excitingly, launched the Mayflower map, and this is charting all the different places in Britain that have celebrated the Mayflower or have some form of connection to uh, the Pilgrim Fathers over the last 400 years. So that's a, a new sort of initiative that we've recently launched online. Um, so I'll give you a brief summary of what the project is and what it's intending to do. So we're exploring how the story of this famous voyage and the pilgrims that transport us has impacted on British culture over the last 400 years. Uh, the project's considering a rich range of novels, plays, films, alongside memorials, statues and um, curated historical buildings as testament to the cultural, political and religious significance of the Mayflower in Britain. It's um, part of what we might term the historical culture discipline of history and we're looking at how history is created and reimagined to fulfill different needs over time um, so we're looking at the Mayflower as an example of modern myth making and examining the cultural afterlife of the story of New Plymouth so we're not necessarily so interested in what really took place in 1620 many historians have already looked at that we're interested in the legacy of the myths of the stories of the poems of the paintings that have come afterwards which we think are a greater sense of history for different people in different centuries. And the coda for our project is really based on our colleague uh, Martha Van Dray's text, Queen Boudicca and Historical Culture in Britain, An Image of Truth. This is looking at, again, Boudicca's cultural legacy. We know very little about her as a figure, but she's had an awfully significant afterlife in terms of paintings, poetries, and songs. And Van Dray talks about the emergence of a popular culture of history really in the 18th and 19th century. And we're aiming to redraw the boundaries between what we conventionally recognize as fictional and factual genres. Often in terms of history, we may refer to things we think as fictional uh, in terms of our understanding of the past. Uh, so I'll give you a quotation from the text, which I think is very significant. Um, Andre says, my argument here rests on the idea that to create a historical product uh, ranging from an authoritative text to imaginative history paintings, historical pageants and films is to engage to varying degrees in a series of actions of knowledge gathering, of synthesis, of interpretation, of negotiation, of narration, of assumption and supposition. That is to engage in a process of making. And all the authors that we going to address today are engaged themselves in the process of making history around the mythology of the Mayflower. So this is our source base. I'm not going to spend too long discussing this but for those who aren't familiar with the story of the Mayflower celebrating its 400th anniversary this year. This is essentially what took place four centuries ago. A group of Brownist dissenters and religious separatists relocate to Leiden in Holland in around about 1607. 1608 after arrest and persecution in England. They make a decision to emigrate to America in 1617. They find the uh, rather permissive atmosphere of Holland a little bit too lax for their liking so they decide they need their own religious community uh, separate. Uh, for what's going on in Holland. So in August 1620, they finally leave from Portsmouth, arriving in New England on the 11th of November 1620. This is quite possibly the worst time that you could ever wish to found a colony, and it was rather a disaster for the group. Around half the members of the voyage perish in the initial winter from malnourishment, cold weather and disease. 
And this story is actually ignored for a very long time. It's originally referred to as the Brownist emigration. The group later become known as the Pilgrim Fathers, but that's really a modification of, of writers and authors. So for a very long time, no one really pays attention to this story, which I think is quite significant. In the colonial era, you have texts such as Mort's Relation or Good News from New England, rather ironically named texts considering the disaster of the first winter. And these texts try to um, celebrate and encourage more emigration to the colony to make sure it's a success. So already the first initial publications, they're dealing in fictional content as much as factual. But we're not going to be looking so much at that work today. We're going to be looking more towards the 18th and the 19th century. And this is where you get the concept of Forefathers Day that starts to be celebrated in New England and memorial and commemorative publications. You have statues and of course the living village in New Plymouth today. Um, and in Britain, the same sort of attention starts to be paid around this time. And it's the concept of the origin of the United States, which starts to take place um, at this moment in the late 18th century. Um, Paul Heiker has called this a story of American beginnings characterized by religiosity, idealism, sacrifice, and a utopian vision based on theology. Later associations with the Thanksgiving celebration also are very important. But again, this isn't until the 19th century that this association between Thanksgiving and New Plymouth is even really made. Other settlements, of course, such as Jamestown pre-exist New Plymouth. So a question I want us to think about as I proceed with this talk today is why do you think that New Plymouth was settled on for an origin story? And some of the authors, I think, are going to give us clues to this uh, encapsulation of the beginnings of a nation within one narrative. So the first um, real attention that's paid towards New Plymouth um, it happens during what's often termed as the American crisis. So during the, 16, uh, during the 1760s and the 1770s, the first popular attention is paid to this in the press in Britain. And this is way before the terms Mayflower or Pilgrim Fathers were in usage at all. Um, and the story is used as a way of showing popular support for, and sympathy for the Americans in their battle with the British government over taxation. I'm borrowing, of course, the term from Thomas Paine here, the famous pamphlet, The American Crisis, begins with the sentence, these are the times that try men's souls. And of course, Paine is born in Norfolk and he's representative of substantial British sympathy for the plight of the American colonists in Britain. And you see this in newspapers. So I've done a lot of work looking at newspapers from this period because this is where the first references to New Plymouth are really made in terms of a popular association between American independence and the founding of New Plymouth. So the Gazetta was a long running British newspaper uh, known for its pseudonyms and its use of political debate, usually on the first and second page. Uh, and these engage in, in discussions about politics. So I'm going to look at one contribution from, he calls himself BT in initials, uh, a plain citizen. And he makes an argument for greater autonomy for the North American colonists that's centered around the settlement of New Plymouth. And of course, citizen rather than subject had a radical anti-monarchical connotation. So even within his pseudonym, he's assuming quite a radical identity. Um, so he says uh, the first settlement made in the province of New England uh, was by a company of poor, persecuted private adventurers without any expense to or assistance from the crown. These men were not transports, rebels or traitors. They were not banished from their country for evil practices. They were a set of sober, conscientious men willing to endure any hardship rather than act contrary to the dictates of conscience. He goes on to say, is it not only lawful by the duty of every Englishman to resist such power and defend his right? And is this privilege, this duty confined to England? Surely no, it extends to every kingdom, every state, every province inhabited by rational beings in the whole world. It is not a law, a right of England only, it is a law of nature, equally binding on all. It is a right bestowed by the great creator himself, which it would be sacrilege to part with. Um, so, in part, this argument put forth in the Gazetta and the New Daily Advertiser is based on natural rights theory, which is an enlightenment concept of government by consent, um, developing from the work of Hugo Grotius and expanded on by John Locke and finding most popular expression in Rousseau's The Social Compact. Uh, and while this article is significant for its connection of New Plymouth to revolutionary 18th century political ideas, we also see this emotive component. They're poor, persecuted people willing to enjoy or any hardship. They're not called pilgrims yet, but they are, will be very soon. And this is a component that's used again and again in, May, in the Mayflower myth, the idea that these are 
poor people that are persecuted and they have to go to New England to escape this persecution. Of course, again, they often ignore the element of Holland here. Um, apart from John Adams, and this is a, reported in major newspapers in Britain and in pamphlets, and he uses this story to celebrate a disconnection from Britain, which is significant because later poets use it to create or engender this special relationship idea that we have in America. This doesn't really exist in the late 18th century. So John Adams says, I say the inhabitants of America have broke forever the ties which unite them to the empire of Great Britain. The first emigrants who laid the foundation of the four northern states of America found in Holland an asylum against religious persons persecutions. Now I want us to consider how much this changes throughout the 19th century. Um, so before the 19th century in Britain you have a narrative to support the American colonists during the American crisis. You have New Plymouth using an example of religious fanaticism and it's very much a footnote, quite literally a footnote in many texts in the histories of North American colonization. In America, the story grows in importance during the 18th century as Forefathers' Day. And it's a justification for independence in Britain and it's an origin story for a new nation. Um, so this is quite a nice extract from a newspaper from the very early 19th century. Some account of the fanaticism of the early settlers in America it takes a very negative view of the dissident Puritans uh, in New Plymouth. It says the states of Massachusetts and Connecticut were originally settled by Brownists and other Puritans and were for many years an asylum for dissenters of all denominations who fled from persecution in Europe to exercise a still greater degree of intolerance themselves when in power in America. A law was passed to prohibit under a severe penalty the smoking of tobacco, which was compared to the smoking of the bottomless pit, uh, the drinking of health, uh, health sorry, and the wearing of long hair were also forbidden under the same penalty. Um, so you can see a collection here of sort of very negative details about these Puritans who have soon become these sort of celebrated eulogized figures in British history and the big change which takes place is uh, a poem published by Felicia Hemans called The Landing of the Pilgrim Fathers in New England. I'll just read a couple of stanzas from Hemans work um, and she really changes the cultural connotations of what's taken place in New Plymouth. The breaking waves dashed high on a sterner rock bound coast and the woods against the stormy sky their giant branches tossed and the heavy night hung dark the hills and water o'er, when a band of exiles moored their bark on the wild New England shore. Not as the conqueror comes, they the true hearted came, not with the rolling strings of drums, of rolls of the stirring drums and the trumpet that sings of fame. So what Hemmers is doing here is celebrating the story as one of pilgrims of conscience um, seeking freedom in the new world. Um, it's first published in um, the Morning Post and then very quickly in the New Monthly Magazine in 1825. Um, and quite quickly, the words are set to music by Hemmens' sister. Um, and this is a huge success. So within the British Library, I found 46 editions already by 1845. That's only 20 years after Hemmens originally published this, this text. So it's an example of popular music. It's a parlour song. Uh, for the 19th century, very popular both in Britain and America. As Gary Co uh, Kelly has commented, the landing of the Pilgrim Fathers becomes virtually a national anthem and has a very large influence on the emergent national culture from the public to the private sphere. So suddenly you have this shift from negative um, stories about the Pilgrim Fathers, um, more radical interpretations, to a much more celebratory, religious and perhaps conservative interpretation of the story. Um, so yeah, this is an example. These are some of the sheet music I found within the British Library. There's many, many different editions of this song. And hopefully, if the tech doesn't fail me today, I'm gonna to play for you just a very quick extract uh, of the music itself. For those of you hoping that I was going to sing along, um, sorry if you're disappointed. I have a terrible singing voice. I hope that worked okay. That, that was a pop, pop song, basically, in the 19th century. Very, very popular both in Britain and America. So just moving on. Oh. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. Moving on to the next text that I want to look at today. So this is an example of just how popular and well-known um, 
the Pilgrim Fathers was by Hemans. So this is a, a beautiful gift book um, by Anne Lydia Bond, who illustrates this text. And she calls it three gems in one setting. Um, and you have the Poet's Song by Tennyson, you have the Field Flowers by Campbell, and you have the Pilgrim Fathers by Hemans. Um, I'll give you some more examples of just how beautifully illustrated this work is. But I also want to think about how canonical this poem is in the mid 19th century. So it's set alongside some of the best known British poets of the era. So it's not very well known today, uh, but at the time it was one of the most well known celebrated poems really in, in British literary history for the 19th century. And I want to zoom in on this image right on the left here of this stern and rock bound coast the opening lines from the poem so this is quite significant as i'm going to talk um, about today this isn't an accurate representation of the, ge uh, the ge geography of new plymouth at all but it becomes highly symbolic uh, as a form of description over the 19th and 20th century um, so three gems in one setting just to give you some more detail about this text it's a selection of heaven's poem um, that's a popular and celebrated gem. So it speaks to its value and its status in the Victorian marketplace. Uh, it's a very high value text of 15 shillings. It was expensive, reflecting its high production costs and its use of chromo uh, lithograph printing. It's highly intricate in its design. The images are presented with interlaced floral borders, which imitate medieval illuminated manuscripts, a style popularized by the pre-Raphaelites and quite common in mid, um, mid-century Victorian art. Um, Bond was a very successful artist uh, and author in her own right, so she produced an illustrated edition of um, Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott, as well as writing uh, and illustrating her own, her own children books, such as The Child's Natural History. And this is very much a text that you might see given to a child in a middle-class family. Um, and again, the Victorians like to use this story to instill values of religiosity and hard work within uh, ch childhood literature. Um, and this is true in America as well. This, this is a Boston text from 1887. This is illustrating uh, Heaven's poem. It's just titled The Breaking Waves Dashed High from the first line of the poem. And you see these pensive and emotional scenes of people landing in New Plymouth, beginning a new colony. Uh, again, this is a, a British example from the same sort of period. This is a, a very small, delicate children's book that I found in the British library. It had to be rebound actually after I found it because it was in such uh, poor condition. But it's a wonderful example of the sort of um, the ways in which this story is reset and resold and reimagined over the 19th century. So here are some some images from the text itself. And again, you can see the same emotional component that's used again and again in um, retelling the story of the Mayflower, pensive, um, brave pilgrims traveling to a new world in the name ostensibly of freedom. Uh, again, you have um, beautiful illustrations of individual scenes all set alongside Hemans, Hemans' words. Uh, and I want us to think again about this particular resonant phrase, uh, the breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock bound coast, because it wasn't actually that, ca that, uh, that case at all. Um, if I flip forward a few scenes, this is the beach at New Plymouth. It doesn't look anything like a stern and rock bound coast at all. And this annoyed quite a few historians. Um, so this is uh, Leon Sharman talking about his reaction to the fact this, is becomes, this becomes a very well-known phrase. It is unfortunate that an English poetess who never even saw New England should be aided and abetted by American school textbooks and school teachers in fixing an untrue picture in many minds. By the time a schoolboy is committed to memory, the breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast, it has become imaginatively impossible for him to think of a pilgrim landed different from the poetical one. Hundreds of such schoolboys grow to various stages of manhood, visit, visit Cape Cod every year, and come to a knowledge of the truth through a stages of incredulity and perplexity. That a poem by Felicia Hemans should be popularly accepted in history um, as the journal written by the pilgrims themselves approach, and the journal written by the pilgrims themselves approach with suspicion is a real disgrace to our popular education. So it's quite an angry um, attack on what Hemans has achieved here. But you also need to think about how history and fiction are bound up together. And what Hemans has done here is created a sentimental, romantic, um, geographical, poetic description, which carries over the Atlantic and carries on in different generations. It may not be accurate in a geographical or geological sense, but in terms of instilling a sense of the hardship they went through, 
you can see how successful it was. Um, Dave, James David Hart goes even further and says, though she tortured history and geography in her accounts of the Mayflower landing, uh, she so thoroughly impressed her views upon the American mind that it's hardly possible for later generations to think of Plymouth, uh, the Plymouth coast as, uh, as stern and rock bound. So I just love the idea that you can torture history and geography, which uh, Hemans was accused of. Um, and again, this is from another illustrated edition. So I just wanted to see the contrast between the, the artwork uh, that is produced depicting New Plymouth and the actual geographical reality, which are very starkly, starkly different. Um, and Hemmer's work goes in to influence, goes on to influence many different novelists of the period. This is Annie Webb's uh, text, The Pilgrims of New England, A Tale of the Early American Settlers. And they take, um, Webb takes Hemans' poem and extends it into Victorian prose, uh, Victorian prose narrative. She says it was indeed a stern and rock-bound coast. Uh, it wasn't, but that doesn't matter. Beneath which the gallant little Mayflower failed her tattered shales and dropped her anchor on the evening of the 11th of November in the year 1620. And thus begins an entire uh, novel, very well um, received and very popular during the 19th century that looks at um, the same story really developing on from what Hemans has provided poetically. And she closes the opening chapter with an extract from Hemans as well. Well have these principles and motives been described by a, a late well-known poet. And well may we conclude this introductory chapter with the last verse of that exquisite song, which the first of which we commenced it. Uh, what sort they thus afar, bright jewels of the mind, the wealth of the seas, the spoils of war. They sought a faith's pure shrine. So again, Hemans is presenting them not as mercantile colonialists, um, not as settler colonialists, but really people that went out of conscience um, for freedom. And I want to move away from Hemans to look at other poetic interpretations of the 19th century. And one, one figure I've been investigating quite a lot is um, the Chartist reformer Ebenezer Elliott. Um, very well-known figure in his own right. So I'm just going to read an extract from Charles Dickens here, reflecting on the life of this impassioned political reformer, uh, Ebenezer Elliot, shortly after his death. Um, Dickens says the name of Ebenezer Elliot is associated with one of the greatest and most important political changes of modern times, with events not yet sufficiently removed from us um, to allow of their being canvassed in this place, that freedom which would serve more fully to illustrate his real merits. Elliot would have been a poet in all that constitutes true poetry had the Corn Lords uh, never existed. So Elliot was a great opponent of the Corn Laws, which kept uh, food and bread prices artificially high and is known as the Corn Law Rhymer. Um, so he was a radical reformist and chartist, worked in an iron foundry during his childhood, was seen as one of the most significant influences on chartist verse. Nigel Cross has commented, Eliot wrote unrepentant political poetry, exhorting the working classes to commit themselves to the struggle against landlords, employers and governments. So he writes a poem um, called The Pilgrim Fathers and it uses what Hemans has already provided, but makes it a much more radical and dangerous political uh, tool, if you will, in order to engender uh, a sense of the need for reform amongst the British working classes and the readership. Um, so he says, just give you a couple of extracts from the poem itself. A voice of grief and anger, of pity mixed with scorn, moans over the water of the West through fire and darkness born, and fiercer voices join it, a wild triumphant yell. They speak, the pilgrim fathers, speak to ye from their graves, uh, for earth have muttered to their bones that we are all soulless slaves. So Eliot's using the origin myth of the Mayflower and the United States. Um, it's really positioned here as a land of freedom in stark contrast with modern Britain. So speaking from the grave, the Pilgrim Fathers are disturbed to find the people of their homeland reduced to soul of slaves. The Pilgrim Fathers are presented as radical freedom fighters, men whose hearts were torches for freedom's quenchless fire. So whilst clearly ahistorical, Eliot is fusing the myth of the Mayflower with the traditions of British radicalism in order to agitate for parliamentary reform. And his works were aimed at a broad and popular audience. So it demonstrates the familiarity of the Mayflower uh, for a 19th century British readership. And he's really using Hemans' um, fame and, the, and the, the, um, how well known her poem was in order to help in the cause of chartism. 
it's a big success, quickly republished in the Leeds Times, the Western Times, uh, the Brighton Patriot and the Leicester Chronicle. The poem went on to be reprinted throughout the century in radical newspapers. Um, indeed, its suitability as a vehicle for reform was noted by the Leicester Chronicle that reprints the text. Uh, Leicester Chronicle says in the last number of Tate's magazine, we have found a voice from the shades of our forefathers who preferred to trust themselves to the uncultivated wilds of America than to the despotism of Stuart. This voice was heard by Ebenezer Elliot in one of his moments of poetic inspiration and he has echoed the spirit stirring cry to the millions of these isles clothed in his own immortal verse. Um, I've even found a copy of this poem in the Red Republican from 1850 um, in this very edition that I'm showing you here. Um, this is a highly socialist and uh, revolutionary publication and as you can see this contains actually the first English translation of the Communist Manifesto on its front page. On the last page, it contains Eliot's Pilgrim Fathers. So you've already gone from Hemans' highly conservative interpretation of the voyage all the way to radical socialism and communism just within 25 years. So you, I'm very impressed with how the Pilgrim Fathers story can sort of move between these different ideological variants. Um, and I'd like to look at uh, another figure from a little bit later in the 19th century, this is Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and she writes a poem very much in conversation with Hemans um, and very um, critical of the Pilgrim Fathers, calls the runaway slave at Pilgrim's Point, the manuscript um, held in the British Library for this, intended to be published in the Liberty Bell, a Boston anti-slavery journal. Um, so it's a controversial mid 19th century poem that grapples with issues of race, slavery and injustice from an explicitly abolitionist perspective, written in the form of dramatic monologue, um, which has the element of emotional immediacy. So you have the poetic speaker talking to you directly as a reader. The manuscript of the poem was originally titled The Black and Mad at Pilgrim's Point, so indicating how foregrounded issues of race were to the work, but also the centra centra um, centrality sorry, of Plymouth Rock to the narrative. The speaker of the poem, an unnamed fugitive slave woman, stands at Pilgrim's Point in an ironic inversion of the history of liberty that had become an integral part of the Mayflower narrative and American national identity. The poem opens with the speaker addressing the pilgrims directly. I stand on the mark beside the shore of the first white pilgrim's bended knee where exile turned to ancestor and God was thanked for liberty. I have run through the night, my skin is dark. I bend my, de my knee down on this mark. I look on the sky and see. O pilgrim souls, I speak to you. I see you come out proud and slow from the land of the spirits pale as dew. And round and round me you go. O pilgrims, I have grasped and run all night like long from the whips of one who in your name works sin and woe. Um, so this poem reads almost as an attack on or an inversion of Hemans, the landing of the Pilgrim Fathers. So the poem criticizes rather than praises the Pilgrim Fathers. It's set in the present rather than the past, and it deals with an immediate political issue of abolition. Uh, it considers the end of a journey rather than the beginning of an origin myth, and it speaks to a long history of injustice rather than a history of freedom. And Browning was really the leading female poet of her generation, just as Hemans was of her generation. So Browning is really making an attack on Hemans' conservatism here and wants to kind of attack the Pilgrim Fathers' legacy and this concept of them beginning a nation based on freedom by looking at contemporary American slavery. Even William Wordsworth, I've recently discovered, publishes a Pilgrim Fathers poem um, around about the same time in 1842. This isn't really examined very much by Wordsworth scholars, but I think it's quite a significant poem in its own right. So the three sonnet sequence um, was first published in poems chiefly of early and late year, uh, early and late years. And as Stephen Gill notes, the last, this is the last separate volume of poetry that Wordsworth published. And it's presented in 1842 as a contribution to social healing. Um, and Wordsworth celebrates the Pilgrim Fathers and also imagines their return and a reconciliation between Britain and America. I'm not going to spend too long discussing this work, but I just wanted to mention it because it's quite significant in its own right. Um, and Henry Reed, his American publisher, sort of encourages Wordsworth uh, to write this poem. And Wordsworth writes back to him, I've sent you three sonnets upon certain aspects of Christianity in America, having, as you see, a reference to the subject which you wished me to write. So Reed's obviously very keen 
looking at Hemmings' success in America for Wordsworth to attempt something similar, which he dutifully does. Um, so I'll give you a brief descript description of the poems themselves. Uh, they're an elegiac tribute to the Pilgrim Fathers and proclaim the men well worthy to be magnified for their accomplishments. Um, Wordsworth overtly romanticizes the story of the Pilgrims. It's a clear focus on the emotions felt by the travelers for their loved abodes and the hallowed ground which their fathers lay. They leave England with sad hearts and offer a last farewell to their friends and country. The home is forsook in exchange for a newfound world and some sheltering nook which they may worship in freedom. And the poem concludes with a combination of natural and religious imagery, celebrating the sanctifying Christian virtues brought to America by the pilgrims. This is a much more sort of celebratory and conservative interpretation of the text, in line perhaps with what Hemmings had achieved around about 20, 25 years before. Uh, and this is celebrated again and again in, in, in British texts that look at the Pilgrim Fathers. This is two illustrations from the romantic story of the Mayflower Pilgrims from 1911. And what you have on the left is an illustration of Wordsworth's poem. And on the right, you have an illustration of Hemin's poem. So they become kind of canonicized. Um, and very starkly, Browning's abolitionist poem is kind of ignored by this in this period. People want to look back on the celebratory poetry of Hemin's and Wordsworth and kind of ignore what Browning uh, and even what Eliot were doing uh, with their more radical poetry. And this is something I've been looking at that I'll just touch upon, but the contribution of British romanticism to the Mayflower story, I, I think is quite significant. Various reasons for this. Um, it's an idealized rural community. You have the wilderness of the New England coast. You have persecuted exiles uh, bound by faith and conscience. You have emotion, you have loss and sacrifice. You have hardship endured and overcome. And you have the founding of a nation, romantic nationalism, something that Hemmings was very interested in. All of these components, I think, meant that the romantic poets themselves became very interested um, and almost obsessed with this story. And it moves on to lots of tourist literature of the early 20th centuries. You have this beautifully illustrated text, The American Pilgrim's Way in England, produced um, for Americans um, tracing their genealogy in, in England. And it sells, again, a very romanticized, uh, idealized uh, picture of, of, of old England. You see some of these watercolors by Mary Chettle beautifully produced. Um, so tracing the homes of the Pilgrim Fathers became a very important part of the way the story is written about and repackaged over the early 20th century. It's another beautiful watercolour of the Standish Chapel there in the nearby countryside. Uh, and about, around about the First World War, you have uh, the British um, National War Aims Committee use the story to produce this pamphlet, The Return of the Mayflower, um, trying to explain to the British public why America has joined the First World War. So if you think back to Adams uh, at the start of this talk, sort of using the story as one of disconnection from Britain, about 100 years later, you suddenly have an inversion of that again. You have the story used as one of connection between Britain and America. Um, and again, yeah, this, this painting hung in Roosevelt's office during uh, World War II, which is the return of the Mayflower, which is the, the boats um, coming to Britain to help with the First World War. So it becomes uh, a very formative part of the special relationship. And the last part of this talk, I want to look at an Irish revolutionary figure called John Boyle O'Reilly. I am conscious I'm slightly running out of time, so I might not be able to cover every single point here. But O'Reilly himself is a Athenian revolutionary. He writes his own Mayflower poetry that I think is quite significant to look at. So I'll give you some details of his life. Uh, born in Dalf Island, he was a journalist, a writer, a poet, and a civil rights activist, a member of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood or Fenian Brotherhood, worked as a recruiter for the Fenians while also serving in the British Army. And in 1866, his activities were discovered by the British authorities and he's charged and convicted of treason. Um, and as W.T. Moody comments, the Fenians had revolutionary politics at their core. The Brotherhood was essentially a physical force movement, which absolutely and from the beginning repudiated constitutional action. Uh, more than any other school of nationalism, the Fenian movement concentrated on a single aim, independence, and insisted that all other aims would decide the point. So 
O'Reilly is convicted of treason, which carries a death sentence. But because of his young age at 22, the sentence was later commuted to 20 years penal servitude and transportation to Australia. And in October 12th, uh, 1867, O'Reilly was transported uh, on one of the last convict ships leaving Britain um, for the penal colony of Western Australia. This is his... Um, writing in the diary at the time is quite excited by this opportunity. Uh, rumour went through the prison, however it came is a mystery, but there it did come a rumour to the prison, even the dark cells of a ship sailing for Australia. Australia, the ship, another chance for the old dreams and the wild thought was wilder than ever. He's hoping to escape. And you can see why the story of the Mayflower might have attracted O'Reilly later in life. Um, on board ship, he writes seven editions of a newspaper um, to keep up the morale of his fellow convicts. Um, he found lasting fame, however, for staging an audacious escape from the penal colony of Western Australia. This is just a, um, an image of the, the newspaper that O'Reilly hand wrote on board, on board ship. You can see it's very close to sort of Irish revolutionary newspapers, the flag of Ireland, um, that were published uh, in Ireland at this time, encouraging uh, revolution and reform. This is an image of the, the prison that O'Reilly was sent, sent to. I'll just skip through a few slides here to move on. Um, eventually, after a few failed attempts, O'Reilly escapes on the US whaling ship Gazelle. He disembarks in Philadelphia in November of 1869, and he eventually settles in Boston, where he found work as a reporter on the Boston pilot. Uh, his obituary kind of gives an, an idea of how well known he was in America at this time. Um, he was one of easily the most distinguished Irishman in America. He was one of the country's foremost poets and one of its most influential journalists, an orator of unusual power, and he was endowed with a, such a gift of, of friendship as few men are blessed with. Um, so his status as a leading literary figure with connections to Boston saw him asked to write a poem for the dedication of the National Monument of the Pilgrim Fathers in Massachusetts in 1889. This is a controversial choice. Some commented that O'Reilly had extolled the narrow Puritans and forgotten their intolerance and accused him of having brought the Blarney Stone into conjunction with Plymouth Rock. Um, I'll just move on to give you a brief extract from this poem. It's a highly radical revolutionary interpretation of the Pilgrim Fathers. Um, so this is O'Reilly's uh, dedication in 1889. One righteous word for law, the common will, one living truth of faith, God regnant still, one primal test of freedom for all combined, one sacred revolution, change of mind, one trust unfailing for the night and the need, the tyrant flower shall cast the freedom seed. They could not live by king-made codes and creeds, they chose the path where every footstep bleeds, protesting, not rebelling, scorned and banned through pains and prisons harried from the land. So he's associating his own transportation to Australia by Britain with the sailing of the Mayflower in 1620, and he sees America as a potential land of freedom, and rather than celebrating this connection of Britain and America, which was taking place in the late 19th century, O'Reilly is trying to remind his readership that Britain is still, um, as he sees it, a very um, negative colonial power in the way it's exercising control over people's lives. So he's, he's using a very radi a radical interpretation of the Mayflower story. So it's an Irish revolutionary reading of the Mayflower myth. Um, the Pilgrim Fathers escape from England, which has been covered by a weed where the richer conspirators against the poor and indulgent nobles claim all rights for themselves. England is portrayed as a rotten state replete with corrupt corpses and venal bishops. It's highly anti-monarchical. Here on this rock, on this sterile soil, begin, began the kingdom, not of kings, but of men. Um, it's a long poem. It's 600 and, uh, 260 lines written in rhyming pentameter. It's very seldom read um, today. So if you guys want to have a look at this um, in more detail, I really recommend it. It mixes Irish uh, revolutionary with English chartist terminology, vocabulary and ideas, attempting this really ambitious synthesis between different traditions, uh, advocates for an idea of global revolution, extends this into a form of anti-nationalism even. Uh, O'Reilly's revolution in the poem is one that he hopes will encompass the death of nations, uh, which were but rubber holds and begin the universal extension of freeborn heritage. 
Uh, the conclusion of the poem offers a vision of a world without borders where the sea shall join, not limit mountain stand, dividing farm from farm, not land from land. So the idea of this 1620 voyage of highly religiously intolerant uh, Puritans becoming associated with global revolution in the late 19th century, I find this fantastic um, change um, and reinterpretation of a historical story, which is kind of what our project is, is trying to, to, to examine. Um, again, the Flag of Ireland have a really positive response to this work, but I better wrap up now because I'm slightly running out of time. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the narrative of the Mayflower is an overlooked footnotes in the narrative of colonization in North America before the 18th century, something that very few people pay attention to. And suddenly during the American crisis, the story of the Pilgrim Fathers rises to public provenance for those opposing the government, both in Britain and in America. And then the Romantic period sees the term Pilgrim Fathers popularized them. Hemmings plays a really key role in this. They become celebrated emigrants of conscience, um, something to look back on fondly as a, as a beautiful moment in sort of the history of Britain and America. But then you have this other battle that ensues afterwards between Browning and Hemmings or Eliot and Hemmings as they both fight to sort of reinterpret the story themselves. Browning particularly attempting to remind us of modern day inequality and not celebrate these people of, as pilgrims of conscience. Um, so as well as Christian conservative authors such as Webbs and, and, and Hemans, radicals and revolutionaries such as Eliot and O'Reilly adapt the myth to suit their own political ends. So this is why I'm fascinated with this, with this story because it encapsulates and deals with so many diff different ideological variants um, in terms of speaking to and writing for different audiences over over the 19th century and yeah i better wrap up there so thanks uh, every day everybody for listening um, i hope i didn't rattle through that too too quickly so thanks guys well thank you um very much uh, ed that was really really excellent um so if you could stop sharing your screen, um, we have a, a yeah. little bit of time for, for questions. So I have, uh, I have a few questions already come in. So thank you very much to, to our audience. Um, yes, this is obviously the bit of digital event delivery, which is particularly strange because obviously, you know, if we were all in a room together, you have that nice opportunity to kind of look around and, uh, and ga you know, gauge people's responses. But obviously we're, we're, we're working with what we've got. So, um, and we're obviously glad that so many people are able to join us who wouldn't necessarily been able to come to a lunchtime talk at the library. Um, so I'm going to kick off um, Ed and ask a question from Phil, who says, obviously to modern eyes, one of the most objectionable aspects of the Mayflower story is the way it presents America as an empty land waiting to be filled with the promise of English and thence Americans of enterprise and freedom. Um, is there any acknowledgement of the Native American presence in any of these um, kind of you know, up to the 19th century period that you're, that you're looking at? Yeah, um, there is. A lot of the time it is conveniently sidestepped um, by a number of these authors. So Eliot, for example, who wants to celebrate America as a land of freedom, in contrast to modern Britain, to agitate for reform. It just doesn't mention the Native Americans at all. Um, they're often used very problematically. Um, Webb, for example, has them as a form of kind of danger that the pilgrims overcome. So they battle against the wilderness and the Native Americans are seen as an extension of the wilderness. So a problem that has to be overcome. Or in other texts, they're, they're presented as having really good um, cordial relations with the Native Americans, which wasn't really the case. Um, and that's another way, I think, of sort of sidestepping the issue. So they're there, but they hover around the margins of the story and they're not really dealt with. They're either ignored or they use as sort of dangerous savages or they're presented as um, having great relations with the Native Americans, which leads into the... Um, Thanksgiving kind of story which is his own mythos really so they are there but they're not grappled with uh, and they're very problematically represented in, in Victorian texts I didn't really have time to go into Native American aspects today but it's a really important part of the way this story has been interpreted and reinterpreted and particularly with the celebrations in America today the Native American aspect of that has been included a lot more I think yeah and, and another sort of element which I think uh, um, a listener sort of noticed kind of falls out of the discussion. Um, so 
Kenneth says, uh, though we're dealing with British literature, can you sketch in why the dissenters went to Leiden? Um, why did it take them such a long time to become dissatisfied and leave? And why did they leave from England? Um, and lastly, um, have the pilgrims been co commemorated in Holland? And um, just following up from that, I thought that was really noticeable that you mm. gave the, the early example of was it Adams who mentions yeah. the, the, the Holland connection. And then it seems to slightly sort of fall by the wayside. So could you just give a, a very quick little overview of that sort of the Holland period and kind of how it then gets used yeah so they're, they're persecuted in, in england in places like like boston uh, and gainsborough in sort of the north of england and uh, eventually they leave and resettle in holland and it's a very tolerant um culture at that period of time but it's too tolerant for the uh, puritans to deal with so people are singing hymns in the streets and you know there's all sorts of like frivolous forms of religious um, culture that the, the Puritans absolutely despise. So they don't want to stay there. It's too tolerant for their form of Puritanical um, religion. So they, they decide to relocate to North America where they can have control really of their religious culture. Now that's a problem for the story of immigrants of conscience that go through persecution because they could have stayed where they were, but it, it's kind of ignored by many different story writers um, and some people include it and some people don't. O'Reilly includes it a lot within that poem. I didn't get a chance to go into that, but he's, he wants to make an example that Britain was, is still an intolerant country and was an intolerant country in the 17th century. So he writes a lot about Holland. Um, but it, again, it's one of those things that hangs around the margins. But yes, it is um, commemorated in Leiden. I was recently at a, another online conference uh, that was held in Leiden talking about the connection between the Pilgrim Fathers and Holland. But it, again, it's a problematic aspect of the story that's glossed over intentionally, I think, a lot of the time. No, that's fascinating. I've got a couple of questions now kind of about sort of literary culture. Mm -hmm. um, and one of, the, one of our listeners uh, asks, why were the poems such as uh, Emmons, uh, Hemmons' and Eliot's published in magazines rather than books of poetry? That's quite common for romantic authors to publish um, in magazines before they uh, set them in, in books. Um, and Hemmons very quickly, like the next year, six, uh, 1826, publishes in Boston and she publishes um, with an advert for the sheet music. And so she really zones in on the American market immediately. So the first book publication of that poem wasn't in Britain, it was actually in America um, quite quickly afterwards. Um, again, for Eliot, it's a reason um, to reach a broad and popular audience. So if you can get reprinted in all of the major radical um, reformist newspapers, you reach a bigger audience than you, you get in a book publication or an anthology. Uh, later in life, his poems are collected in anthologies of Eliot's uh, poetry, but he wants specifically to have everyone read his work and it's the best way that he can do that. Oh, that's interesting. And th this question, um, the, the asker does preface that it's an American literature question. So if, okay. if, it's, if it's a bit beyond the scope, it um, might be a worry. little. Um, but, but Jim says, uh, not British, but how significant was Longfellow's The Courtship of Miles Standish oh. in further escalating the profile of the Mayflower story? A absolutely huge. Uh, I've looked at Longfellow quite a lot because I'm trying to trace Hemmons uh, influence in the United States. Um, Longfellow, um, massive fan of Hemans like collects her sort of signatures and poems and manuscripts and everything uh, and that poem in particular the courtship of Miles Standish uh, I think it really helps romanticize this this narrative um, in that poem the the pilgrims romanticize old England they talk about the church covered in ivy at home that they miss when they've come over the Atlantic to settle New Plymouth so it's a, it's presenting that old picture of beautiful England which you see in some of the artwork that becomes a quite important part of the the story of 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 the Mayflower over the years but that romanticist element it's not just an exclusively British um, component, it becomes very important in America as well. But I'm sort of arguing in my research that Hemmings sets that ball rolling um, and Longfellow kind of goes with it and writes a beautiful, very successful poem uh, of his own. Uh, many different, uh, Lydia Sigourney as well, American author, also touches on the Mayflower, known as the American Hemmings herself. So Hemmings' success in America is absolutely huge and she's very canny. She changes publisher just before she writes and publishes this poem, who has better links to the American market so she can get her books out there really quickly. And it works really well as a strategy. And I just find it funny that Wordsworth's publishers like 
William, you need to do something similar. Your books aren't selling as well. And he doesn't sell nearly as well as Hemmings. Uh, and he does. He tries to write his own. It's not particularly good, but it's, it's an attempt. I mean, he wants to sell his work in America too. And the way you do that is attach it to a well-known story like the Pilgrim Fathers. No, that's, that's really, that's really fascinating isn't it you know and particularly when you think about how canonization then worked in the sort of 20th century and how Hemans is fundamentally almost forgotten figure yeah. against you know someone like Wordsworth who's who's uh, you know survived so I have another question actually about um, the romantics um, Christian says I'm wondering if there's any depictions of the first Thanksgiving this would seem to be great fodder for the romantics so does that does that kind of is it really just the ship and the voyage which which you've been looking at or have you come across these yeah, so I've, Thanksgiving I've, story as well. I've traced the, the Thanksgiving story and it's not until outside of the Romantic period, really, a bit later, that you, you get an American um, reverend, his name escapes me, but he publishes a text claiming that Mort's relation, the first text published on New Plymouth, is evidence for the first Thanksgiving story itself. And again, the issue there is Mort's relation wants to present, this is a fantastic colony, we didn't all die in the first winter, everyone should come over here and invest in our colony, we have great relations with the Native Americans, this isn't really true. And it's presenting a very fictionalised view. But you do have very romantic, um, some of the images I, I, I put up show sort of Native Americans having a, a wonderful meal. Uh, but again, the way they're presented is, is completely inaccurate. So they, they have feathered headdresses that are more representative of the Native Americans of the Great Plains rather than the New England um, Native American culture. So already in those stories, um, you have kind of a mishmash of different inputs that aren't always particularly accurate. Um, so Hemmings isn't really aware of the Thanksgiving story. It hasn't been associated yet. Had she known about it, I think she might have attempted something along those, along those lines. Uh, but again, she's a good example of somebody that just completely leaves out the Native Americans. It's a wilderness. There's nobody there. And that, that's a huge issue for the way this story has been retold, I think, over, over the generations. No, that's excellent. Thank you. And that's, that is, that's a good um, point to make, isn't it, about the period, the, the, the periodization in the 19th century when Thanksgiving starts to it's actually quite distinct from this sort of initial discussion of the pilgrims and the Mayflower. Yeah. It emerges later. Um, and I have another question. Um, John says, to what extent do other European countries pick up on the Pilgrim Fathers? I'm thinking especially the massive interest of French writers in America during the 19th century. Does any of this feature in any of the sort of revolutionary work and then later um... actually that's something really interesting that I, sh I think i should look into i've done a bit a bit of work on on holland's relationship and how that's celebrated and, and sort of canonized almost and that comes a bit later in the 19th century once you get this very well known um kind of phenomenon around the story and it all it's like tourist literature the songs this music this painting and then holland sorts the want get in on the act this is way later than sort of john john adams but i haven't looked at french interpretations i think that's really important because it it's often seen as this anglo-american story and it, it isn't really there's lots of other sort of national inputs as well and it's just i think very ironic it becomes part of the special relationship around the first world war and into the 20th century when Originally, it was about fighting the British and getting rid of the British and saying, hey, we were always independent of you guys. We didn't need your help. We ha we, like, our country was founded by persecuted pilgrims of conscience, so leave us alone. And then later on, it becomes about encouraging a connection and, and military cooperation. So you have this complete shift from ideology of one period in just about a century. But yeah, I need to look into the French, the French component, I think. And just to, to pick up on that, if you started to touch on it, so I'll sort of get to pull it out a bit more. Um, we have a question that says, it seems that the Mayflower story has been used by people for their own aims, yeah. for and against America, for example. Um, do you think this story will continue to be used in the future for similar purposes as propaganda or condemnation? I suppose that's an opportunity to sort of reflect on where you've, you feel the, these 400th anniversary commemorations of where have they sat yeah, on the so spectrum? I think Tom, Tom and Martha will we'd be better at sort of um, addressing this issue. And um, one of the, the elements of our research has been looking at a decline of significance of the story over the 20th century. The big moment is the tercentenary, the 300th anniversary in um, 1920. You have American dignitaries, huge celebrations um, 
in Plymouth and Southampton. But by the 350th anniversary in 1970, uh, it's not very well received. It's not met many people take part. I was speaking to somebody that remembered the celebrations in Plymouth and they tried to sell it as, May, as Mayflower 70, but the locals called it Mayflop 70 because not that many people actually went. It wasn't a huge success. And the story just isn't very fashionable anymore. It appeals to a Victorian sense of imperialism. Um, but I think people are a lot more knowledgeable about Native American cultures, persecution, things like that took place. So you can't simply celebrate a narrative of colonialism like you could in 1920 anymore. And I think even by 1970, it really declined. So you have this story of being very popular exploding about 100, 200 years after it took place. And then you have a a century of decline as well afterwards stays in the American national consciousness but really declines in British national consciousness so how it's going to manifest and modify itself in the future is really um, up for debate I think but I think it's probably going to continue to decline I mean Covid hasn't helped this year but it hasn't been a huge success in terms of um, the an anniversary celebrations so far. Well that has been such a wonderful um, conversation and thank you so much Ed for showing us such you know a wonderfully varied um selection of uh of material because i think i'm sure i speak for, for everybody that you know there's a lot there that i wasn't aware yeah, of i rattled um, through know. a bit fast but it was a lot to get through so <laughs> well thank you so much and thank you very much for all the questions that's really wonderful it's one of the strange things of doing these digital events is i can ed and i can see each other but we can't see you as our our audience so um so thank you so much and i've i've dropped the um link into the chat box again which um takes you to the Eccles Centre recent mailing list, which lists these three events in, the, in our mini series on the Mayflower in Britain. And as Ed mentioned in his closing remarks, his colleagues, Tom and Martha, who are both being, um, both contributing to the next uh, two sessions, um, have been looking at uh, the slightly kind of later period. So the, um, into the 20th century and kind of how this, the tertiary tenery played out. Um, and they also will obviously have reflections on the, the current sort of moment. Um, so thank you so much. We've reached two o'clock, which is the end of our appointed slot. Um, there's also a link in, in the chat to, um, to the Survey Monkey, which we'd be very uh, grateful if you wouldn't mind just clicking through. Um, and there is a, a recording um, being made. And um, I've just seen the questions come in saying, where will it be made available? I don't know if my colleague Brett wants to just jump in quickly um to to give us an idea about that one um he's resolutely muted so um i will <laughs> i just say that i know some of the of our recent events have been going up on the the library's youtube pages um if you're if you're interested if you want to keep an eye on the echo center's um social media um we can always update you i've just seen brett thank you in a, in popped a note there in the, in the chat to say that this will go up on the, on the youtube channel so if you want to share it with anyone who wasn't able to come today or want to, to revisit any of ed's points you're very welcome to um and just to say thank you so much once again to ed and i'm going to give you applause even though you can't hear everyone else um and say thank you and thank you again for coming and we hope to see you um this time next monday so thank you very much have a lovely afternoon Thanks, Kara. All the best. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Are you listening to me? Yeah, well, I said thanks every day, everybody at the end, that annoyed me.